Uh, I'm John Sheridan, I'm the Australian Government Chief Technology Officer. The song you almost heard was Against the Wind by Bob Seger, but actually afterwards I thought a much better song by Bob Seger, who predates many of you I know, would have been Feel the Wind, oh, sorry, would have been In Your Time. <laughs> and the, the thing I like about this song, In Your Time, is it has a particular line about feeling the wind and steering, setting yourself the bolder course. To my mind, this is the message of innovation if you're doing it properly. It's not being afraid to test how things are in the circumstances in which you find yourself. Test the environment and then use that environment to your best, to your best ability to make the sorts of changes that innovation allows, allows us to make. And it's creating that environment that I want to speak about today. Now, I'm talking about the Cretaceous period. And I'll explain why I'm talking about the Cretaceous period in a moment. It's not the Crustaceous period, that's at morning tea. Um, the, the Cretaceous period was the last of the dinosaurs, the last time of the dinosaurs. But more of that in a moment. You'll see I'll also focus in the presentation on a series of shots of Lego, and particularly Lego minifigs. Why am I doing that? Well, firstly, I like them. I think they're very amusing and they cheer me up all the time. But secondly, they remind me of childhood. And I think it's interesting just to reflect on how innovative children are. When you think, it, think about it, children aren't worried about the pressures that we see in work generally. They haven't had it through education, the innovation knocked out of them. They're prepared to try new things to experiment with new ideas. And Lego reminds me of children in that regard. What I'd like you to think about is how we go about bringing back in our daily work some of that innovation that we see in childhood. What is it that we need to do to reverse some of those trends, to get that innovation happening again? Because we all had it in us at one stage. Now, the Cretaceous period, as I said, was the last period of the dinosaurs. There were three major periods of dinosaurs. The Cretaceous was, was the last in that time. The average temperature through the Cretaceous period was about 37 degrees. It was a hot, a humid climate, and it encouraged growth both in flora and in fauna. It was the time of big things, big dinosaurs, big animals, big trees, all those big things. And we are, I think, in a similar period in the public service at the moment. We find ourselves in a situation where we've got all these wicked problems that face us. And we're looking for big solutions to fix those wicked problems. We're talking about multi-million dollar projects, huge amounts of work, lots of resources going into things. But all those Big things have a problem. They stop being agile. If it takes you three or four years to get a project up to start with, what are the chances that the innovation that you had at the beginning of that project is likely to be reflected in the outputs at the end? Sometimes those big things are too hard to turn, too hard to change as the environment changes. And instead, we have the problem that the Cretaceous period ended with, an extinction event. And if you're not clear, science thinks that some 65 million years ago, something very large hit the Earth, wiping out all those big things, wiping out the dinosaurs, ending that period of big, exciting things and taking us back to a smaller arrangement. Now, my thesis today is that if we start with the idea in mind of having good ideas, looking for innovation, but instead of going for those big, long projects, that we put in place something that's smaller, that's incremental, that looks at continuous improvement, that that in itself will help us avoid the extinction events that challenge us at the moment, avoid the sorts of crashes that we see in large projects, and instead, allow us to build and build and build on innovation across <coughs> our organisations and develop a much better, a much more sustainable environment. Now, those of you who are thinking and worrying about seeing the slides, 
I'm going to tweak a link to the slides and they have PDF notes next to them so you can instead enjoy the pictures if you like and I'll do that just after I speak. Now I'm going to talk about the riding the innovation dinosaur. And by the way, this is the last torturing of the analogy slide. <laughs> um, pretty much, anyway. Um, and, and I used the, the, the um, mnemonic raptor. Um, why did I use that? Because all those other dinosaur names are really, really long, and I couldn't <laughs> fit them on the slides. So instead, I'm going to talk about the things that you can see on the slide here. I'm hoping you can all see on the slide here as we go through and discuss what one can do to create an environment for innovation in the organisation. Now the first thing is to secure resources to do innovation. We all know that like the newspapers there are no longer rivers of gold throwing, flowing through the public service that allow us to divert the little bits we need to do innovation. That isn't the case, and I don't know that that's such a bad thing, because innovation in funding, as long as you don't go down the mafia route, innovation in funding is a useful thing for us to be practising as well. But it requires, as good innovation does, some pretty boring management skills. It's about looking at one's budget at the outset of the year, following it through, monitoring it closely, and looking at when, within the scope of the work that you're already doing, how you can harvest sums at the outset, not wait until May to look at the opportunity to do something new, but rather have a list of things that you would do as funding becomes available. Have a list of things that are innovative that you can think, well, as soon as we get some resources, maybe we can devote some of them to doing these things that might change what it is we do. And remembering that innovation in itself is a way to secure resources Often. New ways of doing things can be more efficient, can save funding, and can develop better arrangements as you go through. And the idea that I'm trying to push here is the notion that making those resources available, even in a small way, help guide what one can do using a good innovation approach. Now, agility. Working in IT as I do, you hear a lot about agile processes. And the notion of agile processes is the ability to take a project, to chunk it up into little bits, to sprint, if you like, to deliver capability at the end of those little bits, and then test it against what the users want, test it against the business case, and then go back and say, well, we've delivered that bit, what's the next bit to do in those circumstances? At the end of any of those stages, you can stop satisfied that you've actually advanced what it is that you're doing, that you've made a change in what it is you're doing, and if the resources have dried up or, or uh, priorities have changed, you've got the ability to say, well, that's okay, we can just park this for a little while and come back to it when the environment changes a but the notion here is that to be innovative, you don't need some sort of big bang effect. An agile approach will let you take advantage of the changes to move quickly between opportunities. Now, the challenge for us, of course, is that generally speaking, this is a change in the way that we do business. I'm not suggesting that you, as I've seen sometimes talked about, that you'll throw away your project plans and you sort of conduct your activities on a daily basis without any regard to the longer term or anything else like that. That's not agile, that's just reckless. What I mean in terms of agility is still planning those things out, still working through the things that you're going to do, but making those incremental, fast changes. And what do we know about bosses? If they can see something being delivered, they're going to be a lot more comfortable with what's occurring. They're going to be a lot more satisfied that your innovation is actually bearing fruit. And you might be able to use this agile approach to actually convince some of the unbelievers in the notion of innovation that there are good things that can be done in this regard. Now, giving people permission to innovate is also something of a challenge. And I think there are a range of ways that we can do this. Some of them require different structures 
or different ways of conducting work in a public service. But simple things, some of them, that all of us as leaders can do. The first of these is to describe to your staff what you want in terms of outcomes and to provide them the resources that they need to do that. Not to tell them how to do it, but rather what it is that you want to achieve. Describe in such a way, if you've done it perfectly, that when they come to a decision point and you're not there, because they understand your intention, they can make the appropriate decision without having to go back and ask you again. This is an empowering notion for people. And what it is we see, people that are empowered are much more likely to be innovative than people who feel they have to ask for everything all the time. Now, the challenge, of course, is that this has a structural effect as well. I'm a great believer in hierarchy. Now, I know that people sometimes don't associate hierarchy with innovation, but I'm a great believer in hierarchy. You don't spend 22 years in the army with an appreciation that sometimes you have to do what you're told. But the advantage of hierarchy is that often it comes with relatively large spans of command, spans of control. Lots of people, people with lots of direct reports. Typically, the sort of the research shows you that between five and seven is the right number of direct reports that you can have. Now, what's the advantage of having seven direct reports as opposed to one or two direct reports? It might be hard to micromanage seven people. And if you avoid micromanagement, you avoid the innovation crushing way of telling people how to do things. Because you're actually divorced from that. You have, you're forced to step back and make changes about the organisation's direction, apply all that management across that span of control, rather than driving what particular individuals are doing. And setting individuals free in that regard sponsors innovation, allows them to have good ideas. And that, to my mind, is a very important structural difference about what it is that we're doing. Now, technology is the next thing that I'd like to speak about. <laughs> I'm going to dwell on this for a few minutes because there are a range of technology changes that I think that we can make and utilise in our work to drive innovation. The first of these is the use of social media. Now, social media has a range of useful things. Uh, this, the notion of communication, there's the notion of co collaboration. But one of the really important things that social media has driven for us is actually in the boring subject of procurement. Now, you might think, well, how does that work? Probity has meant over time that, use, that we're forced with two situations. We're either tell everybody everything or nobody anything. And until social media, there really wasn't an opportunity to tell everybody everything. And as a consequence, I've gotten up at industry briefs, um, that there's all these industry people have come for a procurement, and the first thing I've been required to say by probity is, nothing I'm going to tell you today has any impact on anything you're doing. If it's not written down in the paperwork we've distributed to you, it doesn't exist. And you think, well, why would we do those sorts of things? What social media has allowed us to do is through blogs and like mechanisms is to publish what we're doing so anyone can read it and then use that ability through crowdsourcing to collect information from people at very early stages. One of our little innovations has been to put draft statements of requirement or draft policies out on our blog and encourage industry, stakeholders generally, to communicate with us about what they see as the issues in those things. And we've discovered some interesting changes. We've discovered the sorts of things that really worry government procurers. By going out and using this innovation, we've made sure that we're not in the position of buying things that aren't for sale or trying to buy things that aren't for sale. Because we go out to the market and we say, well, we're thinking about this, and they say, well, no one sells it like that, we sell it like this. If you try and buy it that way, we'll sell it to you, but the costs will be driven up. 
And going out and crowdsourcing those ideas really changes what it is that you can do. Now, the notion of crowdsourcing, of course, doesn't have to apply just to the sense of procurement. The notion that you can use crowdsourcing to attack, to get hold of the good ideas that might be amongst your staff, for example, or amongst your stakeholders in a policy sense, that also provides a broader field, if you like. It widens the opportunity to get new ideas. Now, one of the things about ideas is not all of them come to fruition, not all of them lead to innovation. But unless you've got a means of getting those new ideas, of harnessing the imagination of the people who work for you or the people that you're trying to serve, you don't have an opportunity to be, an opportunity to be as innovative, innovative as you should be. And social media has really helped in that regard. The next thing is about mobility. It's not just using mobile phones to give presentations. Um, but rather the notion that mobility provides people with an opportunity to work in different environments and in different places and at different times. This is an opportunity, first of all, to harness the talents of some people that previously might not have been able to be part of the workforce. And that's an important change. It's also the ability to let people work in an environment that suits them Sometimes people will be more creative in their pyjamas at home than they will be sitting, a, at a suit, sitting in a suit at their desk or cubicle in the office. The notion that there's the opportunity to do that occasionally, to change what it is that you're doing, is the real ability that mobility provides us. It's the notion of having the, the, the opportunity to capture an idea wherever you are, to record that, to get it down, to take a picture of something that's new and different and feed that into the mix in a way that we couldn't do before. I know it sounds you know, relatively simple and you think, well, of course people do that. But it's interesting, this change in mobility and what it's meant for the work and the generation of ideas. And I think it's a really important change for innovation. The next thing I want to dwell on for a moment is the application environment, the app environment. One of the interesting things we've seen in the use of iPhones or Android devices, those smartphones or related mobile devices, is the notion that we fill them with applications. Now, applications aren't the major programs that you know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago we were using in computers. These are small, little programs and they grow. We accept the fact, in fact, if we have our settings right, we don't even know it's happening. We accept the fact that they'll be improved incrementally over time. We accept the fact that the designs of these little applications, things that cost a couple of dollars at the most, will incorporate changes, incorporate innovation, and move their project forward incrementally. Now, some of them will pay off and some of them won't. Some people like them and some people don't. But this notion of little ideas, little programs being built on as part of the day-to-day -day work in a way that we now just accept is going to happen all the time. This, I think, is a really innovative change in the use of technology. And it's one that we can copy, I think, in our normal work, even if it isn't about computer programming. The next is the notion of open source computing or open source software. And this is the idea that the code behind projects or the code behind programs is published in a way that anyone can see it. That it can be changed publicly in, according to a, a set of processes. It can be updated. Everyone can see what's going on. People contribute to the whole. And this is, I think, a number of lessons for us in the concept of innovation. Firstly, again, it's the notion that all of us can, can, can contribute in our own way to improving the work. It's not siloed, necessarily. There's the opportunity for us to see what's going on. Even if we only put our foot in the pool just a little bit or look at it occasionally, we can see what the changes are, we can understand what other people are doing. We can be inspired by those changes. But secondly, the other thing that open source provides 
is cheaper computing. The notion that these programs are actually free, generally speaking, that we can get that intellectual property by contributing, not paying for it, means that the work we can do in open source is very different from the work that we can do with monolithic big programs. And I think this also allows us to drive change in new and exciting ways. Now, I should have mentioned that the presentation I'm giving at the moment does, isn't using PowerPoint, if that wasn't obvious. Um, it's actually using a, a very cheap app called Haiku Deck. And Haiku Deck allows you to build slides, and you'll see that it doesn't really allow you to have long slides with lots of text or anything else like that allows you to build slides in a way that improves presentation. It addresses one of the challenges of making slides with nice pictures on them, in that all the pictures that you access through this arrangement are licensed in, as using the Creative Commons arrangement for licensing, which means they're properly protected. So the intellectual property of the people who took the photos <coughs> is protected, and we can use them easily to make slides. Now, this is, I think, another small innovation in what it is we're doing. And it's in an innovation that's important that the people in our organisation who are in charge of media and presentations need to understand. There are times when using the official template for your slides is a useful thing to be doing. But there are other times when innovation in presentation should be allowed. And by having those little rule changes, those little relaxations of what's going on, what's going on, we can contribute to creating that innovation environment across the organisation. Now, finally, in this bit about technology, I want to talk about cloud computing. No IT presentation in 2014 is complete without a discussion of cloud computing. Now, cloud computing isn't actually about technology, it's about procurement, another of my favourite subjects because it's a better way, a cheaper way often, to buy computing services. Now what this means in terms of innovation is it can be cheaper to set something up. It can be cheaper to try something in the public cloud in a way that doesn't compromise security because I'm not suggesting you're going to put privacy information there or secure information or anything else like that. But in terms of using test and development environments, in terms of testing new arrangements, in terms of trying new ways of doing things, the very cheap turnover or the very cheap cost of cloud computing can really enable useful changes. We're seeing in some of our major applications savings of 80% or more in terms of moving from a traditionally hosted environment to a cloud computing environment. And what it means is that you can make, take advantage of that to do simple things. 